Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. Um, okay, I want to start with uh, what's left in this course. So we have only, after today, we have only three more uh, course uh, sessions. Uh, I want to remind you of the announcement I sent out about poster drafts. So by the uh, Wednesday, by the class time, you should all submit your poster draft, which should already be a solid draft. So I don't want to see copy pasting of chunks of text and things like that. If you do that, that's not going to be sufficient for the purposes of the draft. Then we are all going to be here and or on Zoom if that's better. And you are going to polish your posters and submit the final version by the uh, end of the class time on Wednesday. And one important thing that's different in this course than others is that there is no final reports. Rather, your results on your poster and uh, your presentation uh, at next week will serve as the final report. So um, take this final version seriously. If you, there is something you want to show, highlight, it should be uh, it should be there. So basically, on Wednesday you should have the final outcome. Any questions about the posters? Yep. Oh yeah, I I wanted to bring examples and then I forget. Um, let me ask around for some examples of posters and uh, I will I will share them. Yes, sorry, I really wanted to bring them. They are in my office. I just didn't get to uh, bring them here today. Um, yeah, I will I will send you some posters uh, probably tomorrow morning. Okay, so next Monday, we will also have an exam here in person on paper. It's going to be multiple choice uh, exam. Uh, and it's mostly going to be about very uh, important concepts that we cover in this course, nothing intentionally super hard or adversarial. I think the overview we are going to go over today is going to serve as a good reminder of things we have learned in the course. You are also allowed to have a uh, one page, both front and back with notes. They can be handwritten, digitally produced, uh, any font, whatever you deem important, uh, you can put it uh, there. You are going to submit those notes with your exams if that's uh, relevant. Any questions about the exam? <clears throat> okay, and then uh, next Wednesday, we are going to have our final uh, session where we are going to have this poster presentation. You all are going to also be assigned to another project that you will need to go and check out and then uh, submit um, a few answers in a grade scope. Those are already, I think, available uh, for you to check out if you want. Um, this is just a forcing function for you to move a little bit around and see uh, other projects uh, that are done in the class. And yeah. I think that's it. Any questions about what's left? And of course, a bunch of grading is left, which I do have in mind. Okay. Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah. No, there will be no practice exam or, yeah, any additional materials to what's available on the website. Okay, so uh, what are what we are going to do today is just go over all of the topics uh, we have covered in this course, which is very ambitious for 80 minutes. So I'll talk, be talking really fast, but also you have seen this before. So it's um, everything you will hear today you have already seen previously. This is just a way to kind of wrap everything uh, up and remind you of some of the topics we have talked about before. So if you remember ages ago when we started, we started with, okay, there are these machine learning uh, models that we are training. And these days we are also involving some experts in certain domains because these domains are high risk. And these people will then in collaboration in human through human AI teaming are going to uh, give a final um, you know, prediction here, a diagnosis to a patient. And I have told you that uh, this is, it is increasingly harder to opt out from these kinds of uh, technologies. Um, although there are 
notable risks, such as uh, doctors themselves might not, might not want to collaborate with these tools because they can hurt their patients by giving them incorrect diagnosis because they were deceived by tools, and this can even lead to uh, serious uh, consequences for them. And then patients who might not even have anything uh, to say in the way that these algorithms will be applied to them uh, might obviously uh, be uh, seriously injured. So uh, given this situation, we have said uh, in August that the, these people who are involved in these kinds of ecosystems, they want to know why is the input assigned certain answer? Why is this clinical note from a patient assigned uh, a flag that this person might be a high risk of having a diabetes, for example? And um, in this course, we have gone over multiple methods of how we can address these questions, such as uh, showing, uh, highlighting which words or image batches were responsible or important for the prediction, um, what kind of uh, interactions between features, for example, words were important, what kind of human interpretable concept is important, what kind of training examples were important, and uh, we have also talked how to uh, just generate in plain English uh, the reasoning behind the prediction. Um, so what I'll do now is I will just quickly go over all of these uh, again. Uh, we started with uncertainty estimation where um, we have said, okay, we have this human AI theming framework. And uh, if we had also confidence in a model uh, that might be really helpful for a person to decide whether uh, the model is correct or wrong if this confidence scores themselves are reliable. So for example, here, if the model says that the mo uh, that the person is um, uh, sick and that they are 87% confident, highly confident they are sick, the person might say, well, uh, given the reliable confidence scores, I deem that the model is uh, correct. I will not read the very long clinical note and I will just recommend whatever the model is recommending. Another way around, if the model is very, um, has very low confidence about its prediction, uh, the uh, uh, clinician in this situation might decide, well, I really don't want to rely on this model that has low confidence, and instead I'll uh, do actually read this clinical note, spend this time on this uh, more complicated case. Um, <clears throat> So there are, we talked about many different ways we can calculate uncertainty, but one appealing approach is to take the max of the softmax factor. Um, so this is the score uh, associated with the predicted label. Um, and we want to use this because it's very simple, very intuitive. It has, although it's not a probability, it has this nice uh, notion. And the issue with you doing that is that the max of the softmax vector is not calibrated. We introduced this term, which means that it's not necessarily true that the probability of the model being correct for that instance is the max of the uh, softmax. Um, and if you don't remember what this exactly means, we have seen this with uh, this example of a vision model trained to classify digits. It has never seen anything else than digits. So if we give it any kind of object that's not a digit, it should predict whatever um, digit it predicts, but it should very have very low confidence. That would be a reasonable expectation from this model. However, what we have seen is that uh, when we uh, choose any of these uh, clothing items is that the model does predict the digit because that's the only thing it can do, but it also has a very high confidence. Um, in other words, 97% confidence here means that the model is 97% of the time correct in predicting this uh, image of a shoe where we know that it's 0% times correct because it simply doesn't have the labels for uh, these clothing items. So just a moment, excuse me. Um, so uh, this situation where this uh, probability is not the true probability that that's the uh, fraction of times the model will be correct for this example, means it's not calibrated. 
Um, and to measure the errors from calibrations, we have introduced expected calibration uh, error. And if ECE is low, we have said that the max of the soft max can, uh, cannot assist human AIT, right? It's just, we know that the error is high. So uh, we didn't give up, of course, that's not what we do. Uh, we have covered many multiple methods of how we can then uh, fix this. And uh, one of the very commonly used methods is temperature scaling, where we uh, tweak our softmax uh, equation slightly by introducing the term capital T, uh, such that higher values of T soften probabilities, meaning if there was a very high uh, probability for one digit, such as for digit two, when we gave it shoe as an image, we want to, to, to make this uh, softmax um, more uniform. And we can achieve that if we have T, capital T, larger than one. Um, if we do that, we are, in this way, we are fixing the model's overconfidence. Another side of the coin is model's underconfidence. Um, so here, we actually want the model to have more peaks on certain uh, classes. And to achieve that, we choose values of t that are smaller than 1. Of course, uh, we don't know a priori what t should be. And this is our hyperparameter. So we are going to optimize t on a held out calibration set to minimize the uh, negative log likelihood. We are going to train our uh, model on a train set. We are going to use held out calibration set where we are going to, uh, with just a few lines of code, uh, optimize T. So we are doing basically something like gradient descent, but we are changing and instead of like billions of parameters, like usually with neural networks, we are changing just a single uh, parameter T here. And we do need another test set now because uh, we need to see whether our uh, calibration will actually work on a held out uh, test set that we did not use to tweak the parameter T. Okay, so this is really a super quick uh, overview of uncertainty estimation that we have talked about. And what's important for you to remember besides these points is that this is your baseline when you are evaluating whether explanations are useful for human AI teaming. You're not evaluating whether they are useful with respect to not showing anything else than AI's recommendation. You need to show person AI's recommendation, these uncertainties, uh, calculate what the uh, their human AI uh, team accuracy is, and then another group will also be given explanation. And also only if you see the boost in accuracy, when you also provide explanation, you can say your explanations are helpful. So if you show they are helpful, when you don't show the, the model's confidence, you have chosen too low of a bar for yourself. Your baseline is not strong enough, although a stronger baseline exists and it's easy to compute. So when you leave this course, please use this as, the, uh, as, your, as your baseline. Okay, um, moving on to another way of uh, finding out why is the input assigned this answer. We have talked about just providing in plain English why is the input assigned the answer. And I have given you this uh, motivating example with this elderly lady that wants to understand why a certain Facebook post was um, labeled as misleading and uh, her interest in whether, to knowing whether there, she's missing out on this great opportunity and here we have this really long sausage of a sentence, but it's misleading because uh, basically she's, uh, uh, you need to have certain qualifiers to qualify for this. It's not like you are just being uh, an elderly person, uh, a retired person in the US. So here I wanna go over a few things that I feel like are kind of uh, confusing. Uh, still after we have covered this topic. Namely, I want to go over the difference between fine-tuning for self-explaining, meaning fine-tuning to produce a sequence that has a label and an explanation in plain English. Um, difference of that with chain of thought prompting 
and then difference of those two things with instruction fine tuning. Because we have covered these three terms, but I feel like at least in some conversations with you, they have all kind of merged together. So first, fine tuning a sequence to sequence model to generate label and free text explanation uh, is done by taking some data set. In this data set, you have all training uh, instances and you might have hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. You are going to use them all. And you're going to format them one by one by producing a string, a sequence that includes this uh, input uh, instance. So here we have a question, multiple choice question answering example. In a single string, we are going to place a question and all of the choices. Important thing I want to emphasize here when we are just doing a sequence to sequence fine tuning approach to this, we are not concatenating more examples like we do in few shot learning or in context learning. So here we just have our single example as in the input. So which was the standard way of doing things before in context learning became a thing. And you will have that input, and as your output, you will have another sequence, which will start with the right choice, word because, and then explanation for it. And you are going to use all of your training instances formatted in this way uh, to do conditional text generation, where your condition is this input sequence. Given this input, you are starting to generate next word, which are the label because explanation words. And at the inference stage, where you want to generate labels and explanations for new instances, you are again going to give an input of a single instance. Now, don't be confused with batching and in-context learning. Of course, you are going to batch multiple independent instances together, for example, 32 instances in a batch of size 32. In in-context learning, you are also going to batch, but each about example in the batch will also include more examples. So I don't know whether this is making sense to you, but just pay attention to, to this uh, detail because I have heard multiple times that um, we think that we always put few examples when we are doing fine tuning. Now, chain of thought prompting is an instance of in-context learning where we have also a prompt to elicit explanations. So we have a task instruction such as explain this, explain this in a certain way. You have few examples from your training set, let's say eight examples. And only at the end, you have your new instance that you want to get the um, explanation for. So you finish on the answer semicolon, let's think step by step, which is a part of, uh, of raising of the original chain of thought prompting, then explanation, so the answer is answer. Here, we don't do any fine tuning. What we have done here is for every evaluation instance for which we want an explanation is put in the same input sequence, few examples from the training data, let's say eight. And going back uh, to, to making batches, each one of these instances will have eight examples in the input, but we'll then combine these 32 together to do a faster inference. So batching and in-context learning, two different things. And then I think what, what confused you is instruction fine tuning where someone, usually not us, because this is actually computationally expensive, this can um, be done with 2 million or 20 million instances, huge amounts of data. So usually big labs do they do, after self-supervised pre-training, they do this step of instruction fine tuning, where they are formatting their fine tuning instances in, uh, in, in this, excuse me, in this way, where they concatenate few examples and they also elicit explanations. And this is such that later on, when we use these models, we can have good in-context learning abilities of our models and also better explanations. But usually we don't do this. We, when we fine tune models, we don't put few examples in the input sequence. 
no one is preventing us to do that. And I don't know whether that would also lead to better uh, to better fine-tuned models, but usually this stage is done by just people who are releasing these models that we built on. Okay, is this clear how just sequence to sequence fine tuning uh, in context learning with chain of thought prompting and instruction fine tuning differ? Are the conceptual differences clear? Okay, I see a few nods, no opposite of nods. So I take it as it's clear. Um, something I didn't show you before is that I show you a few examples of more advanced prompting, something that has been, um, you know, that has emerged after chain of thought prompting. And uh, this is a very recent survey uh, that outlines many, many uh, ways of prompting to elicit reasoning and explanations that have emerged uh, uh, later on. So if you're looking for something specific for your case in terms of what kind of reasoning you want to uh, generate, there might already be a method uh, for you. So definitely check out this before deciding that you need um, to produce another way of prompting models. Upon seeing this, I'm also wondering uh, what's the higher level picture here? What are is exactly that we are trying to solve? Um, we have all of these different ways to maybe improve the ways models generate their reasoning. Um, but how much of this um, prompt searching will need to be done that together as a you know research community that produces these individual ways of prompting, we have found something that can actually do uh, all of these uh, together. So I don't have an answer for you, but I do recommend you to think about it, like what's the higher level picture here? I don't think the goal is that we produce yet another way of prompting uh, model. I think the models themselves should be able to be um, able to generate reasoning regardless of specific wording we use, whether we use let's think step by step or something, uh, something else. Okay, so um, to wrap up the generation of reasoning in plain English. First of all, there have been different ways of calling this before chain of thought prompting had emerged on the scene. We have natural language uh, explanations, textual explanations, free form, free text, abstractive rationales. Uh, so if you are looking at literature before 2021, 20, uh, 20, um, I think, um, let me just check. I think I have the year on the previous one, excuse me, 2022, when the, uh, original chain of thought was proposed, uh, you will see similar methods um, just described uh, differently. Um, we have covered this so quickly about the evaluation. We have talked about plausibility evaluation, and these are basically crowdsourcing studies we have done uh, in past week where you are asking annotators uh, to tell you how um, well the answer is justified by the explanation. And um, later on, we'll go over the taxonomy of evaluations. We have said this is a, a type of human grounded uh, evaluation because it does involve people, but it's not application grounded because it's not that in practice when people engage, for example, in these human AI themes, a clinician is not really uh, using explanations in that way. They are getting explanations to make final decisions. So in that sense, they are not application grounded, but they are human grounded. Um, we have also talked about more fine-grained evaluation uh, through our uh, paper discussions. We have mentioned that uh, we might want to measure semantic consistency, logicality, informativeness, fluency, factuality, and so on. And more and more, we see these papers that try to provide these fine-grained scores for the uh, reasoning that's uh, generated rather than this one uh, plausibility uh, score that should encompass all of these different factors. And then completely orthogonal to plausibility, we have uh, faithfulness, where uh, in the paper discussion, we have uh, read, uh, read uh, one uh, example of how to go about this. Um, it is, all the papers we mentioned are 
necessary conditions for faithfulness, but they are not sufficient conditions for faithfulness. So we have produced some tests that must be fulfilled for explanation to be faithful, but it doesn't mean that another one doesn't exist where the model could fail. So if they fail on these necessary conditions, we can say they are not faithful, but if they pass all these necessary conditions, we still can't say about the faithfulness in general. Um, and yeah, basically what we have done is intervene on generated explanations. We cut them, we introduce um, information that's not factual, and we know that something should happen. If we introduce information that's not factual in the generated reasoning, we know that the, the answer should flip. Um, we have also talked about how difficult this is um, to reliably also conclude because uh, the model is so parameterized, it can have totally distinct factors for uh, generating this reasoning and to generate the answer. And uh, its answer might actually be um, influenced by some other mechanism that is actually correct reasoning, but it's not really the one that generates the words. So by doing the funky things on, on you know, to on the generated words, we are maybe just testing that component that is responsible for just producing the words, not about, you know, wherever the actual reasoning is captured. So this is incredibly difficult to, to confirm. Like faithfulness of free text explanation is this incredibly hard challenge. Um, and I told you to be aware of that and not be trapped by this, you know, madness of you must show it's like 100% uh, faithful. We have talked about work from Alonia Kobe about the gradient of uh, faithfulness. And all these words, they, works, they don't really say that, you know, they, they say these are faithfulness measurements, but I would say they are actually this necessary condition that put these models somewhere in this spectrum of faithfulness rather than saying anything binary. So yeah, lots of work to, to be done here. And if you think of maybe super ahead in the future, models that are more controllable, that plan, and maybe somewhere where we can have components that we can localize and say that certain uh, mechanisms actually happen there in neural networks, uh, we might have a better chance at, um, at understanding whether these models are actually using these uh, reasonings they are generating. Okay, um, so moving on to another topic, which is uh, finding and addressing our you know, umbrella question of why is this input assigned the sensor by pointing and highlighting parts of the input that are responsible for the prediction. We started with the uh, gradient-based explanations where we take some function of the input, such as the loss with respect to the predicted class. And then we calculate the gradients with respect to each token embedding. We have said that that will give us gradient of the size of the input in, uh, embeddings, which is not desirable since we want to have a single value, a single importance course for each token. Therefore, we had to deploy some normalizations uh, to, to squash them into a single uh, number. And then we have also said, we don't want just importance of each token, we want importance relative to other tokens in the input. So we also normalize with respect to all the other important scores in the input. Um, that's one way to go about it. What I've just said, we have talked about many different choices we can make. And through one of the uh, paper discussions, we have learned that there isn't a magical choice, right? Uh, we have seen through uh, retrieving data artifacts that, uh, for example, more advanced uh, gradient highlighting methods such as integrated gradient worked worse than just vanilla gradients, which it wasn't super uh, intuitive. So be cautious with which kind, which kind of intuitions you're making. I would say that each one of these is my modeling choice. You have your development sets, figure out what's best on the development set and use that on your test data. Um, so gradient-based highlighting is an example of post hoc method where you have a trained model and once it's trained, you deploy this method to say something about why it makes prediction. But the gradient itself are, um, you're you are applying them after you have um, trained the model. And there are 
uh, different techniques where um, these interpretability mechanisms are designed to be in, uh, inherent to the model itself. So this is something I have covered in the videos when I was sick with COVID. Uh, one of the approaches to do highlighting that's not post-hook is so-called select and predict approach, where you first have so-called rationale extractor that assigns zero or one to each token, zero meaning you are not important, one meaning you are important. And then uh, we zero out all the tokens that are not important and only pass to the predictor component of the model, uh, the, the words, the tokens that survive. Um, important in this initial approach from 2016, from Lei et al, uh, just a second. Um, this is a super important work. You should all read it and be uh, aware of it. Important here is that um, you don't use human written highlights to train this model. Rather, your whole supervision comes from the uh, loss with respect to the predicted uh, label. So it's an example of weak supervision. Yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, you had training of the output with respect to features. Just a moment. Yeah. Output with respect to features. So I'm wondering what that means. Like, is it with respect to the entire input or it's not possibly actually the features? So uh, features in uh, text are our tokens. Each token is represented with a token embedding, which is a high dimensional vector. So uh, as an, our output function, we can use different uh, options. We can use the, uh, the max of the soft max. We can use uh, what I suggest we should be doing, uh, loss with the top predicted class as the true class, although it's not necessarily. Um, so you take that number, and then you back propagate all the way to each one of the token embeddings, which will give you gradients, which will be of the size of the token embeddings, which you need to turn into a single vector number and then normalize with respect to other scores. Yeah, so we have covered this extensively. So I recommend just maybe rewatching that, uh, that lecture if some of these details were forgotten. Okay, so I was saying that we are we can also do select and predict approach where we do everything, um, do this selection of tokens uh, through model training. Uh, this um, this uh, tokens that we selected, we shouldn't be selecting too many of them, um, and they should also be in a way coherent. So uh, we want to uh, encourage the model to pick phrases such as like not good instead of just maybe not. Um, and it should also have the property of sufficiency that on its own, it's sufficient to make the prediction, uh, which is kind of intuitive. If we think that if these are important tokens, then they have to have this uh, power. And you can achieve all of that through uh, adding things to your loss function. So uh, here the we have used a, somewhat like a language modeling loss to uh, encourage coherence. We have also introduced this uh, penalty. So uh, if you are um, if you are choosing one uh, token but not choosing previous token, that will give you penalty. Um, and you won't get a penalty if you are not choosing um, you know consecutive tokens together or you are choosing them together. Also, you want them to be short. Therefore, this vector z, which is the vector of zero and one whether token is included or not should be small with respect to its norm. And to have insufficiency, uh, you should get the prediction with the, um, with, the, um, in, with the partial input where you have masks, these important selected tokens, uh, uh, you, you should be able to make the prediction, correct prediction just from it. So when you put all of this together, but you are not observing the uh, human, uh, you're not using human written uh, explanations or highlights here, and then you don't have the supervision for your Z, vectors of zero, so one. And that puts you in a pretty funky place because uh, you want to also uh, backpropagate through those components. So you need to minimize the expected loss. Um, it is challenging because it falls summing over all possible choices of highlights. And um, in this work that can show 
that we can use, um, that we can just um, use the reinforce uh, algorithm to do this. Later on, it has been shown that this is pretty unstable. Then people have developed a super simple ways of doing that. this where you have completely uh, separate models, one that extracts, one that then predicts just based on what's extracted and so on. Uh, so it's been pretty vivid uh, line of work that followed this, uh, I would say, pretty famous paper in 2016. So here I just want to remind you of this one uh, example of select and predict in the video. I have uh, also given you some uh, follow-up works. So in this in this um, slide, we have basically everything about our highlighting methods. First of all, we have uh, talked about how they come with, under plethora of names. I like the word highlighting because it's pretty, um, it doesn't suggest uh, anything human-like. Uh, in image, they have been known as saliency or sensitivity maps because you are putting uh, these kind of highlights over these 2D uh, images. We have input attribution, importance, relevance, contribution, or the select, select and predict uh, highlights are called extractive rationales uh, too. So when you are doing literature review, just searching for highlighting won't do it. Like you need to really go uh, and search all of these different terms. We have talked about computing gradients, select and predict. Something we didn't talk uh, in the course, but it doesn't make it less important are the input perturbations uh, approaches where you perturb certain inputs um, and then you check the uh, sensitivity to the output. So leave one out, lime are examples of these. And uh, I encourage you to check these uh, works, especially lime that has been uh, very uh, widely used. Um, for plausibility of highlights, we use human um, produced highlights. Uh, so with text, this is easier. You can just ask people, hey, highlight all the words uh, that are important here. You can do the same with images, I believe. I didn't see much of that. I seen people, uh, some of the works checking um, while people annotate just the image classification problem where their eyes are focused. And I think that's a very good signal. In any case, you are going to then measure the overlap between what your method has highlighted and what human author uh, highlights are. You can use exact match F1. You can use intersection of a union F1 or token F1. If these terms are, uh, you completely forgot what they are, go uh, check the corresponding lectures where these things are explained. For faithfulness evaluation, checking whether the words we have deemed to be important or pixels we deem to be important, uh, we have talked about a few methods. We have talked about uh, whether a method um, consistently places the shortcut tokens on top of its important rankings. So this is the paper we have uh, read all together, will you find my shortcuts? So you know that the model, uh, if uh, that the model had, um, you train the model to use shortcuts. So you know that shortcuts must be, data shortcuts must be important. And if those shortcuts are not reflected in your top retrieve tokens, you know that something had gone wrong and that your method for finding important tokens is flawed. We talked about sanity checks. Uh, again, this is an example of a necessary condition, not uh, sufficient, where you check that if your data is randomly labeled or if you replace the weights with random weights, that the importance rankings will change. And we have seen in this work that this doesn't really happen because these importance um, methods actually behave like edge detector. They are not really giving us these are pixels that are important for the prediction, rather these are the edges of objects in the image. We talked about normalized sufficiency and comprehensiveness, that sufficiency, uh, sufficiency being that important tokens on their own should be predicted of the label and everything aside, outside of them should not be. And then you can say confidently uh, that these uh, important tokens are truly important because Nothing outside of them can hint on the predicted label and on their own, uh, they can. 
So you need really need to have both sufficiency and comprehensiveness. Um, um, if one of them is not achieved, then that relieves the room for doubt of whether the important tokens that we have retrieved are really important. We also talk about the erasure or recursive roar. Uh, erasure being you leave out your important tokens and now your uh, performance should drop, right? If there are no important tokens, if they, the performance can be good. Um, we have said that the issue with this could be that by dropping tokens or replacing them with um, tokens that the model didn't see during pre-training can uh, lead to producing examples that are out of distribution to the model. So if you're getting a drop in performance, this could be just because you are now introducing something that the model has never seen. So what Roar suggests is that we should retrain the model with these partial inputs and check the performance uh, now that with their retra retrained model. They also say we uh, need to have some reference points. So we should be uh, dropping randomly, same number of tokens, retraining the model and checking what's the drop in performance when we use uh, partial inputs, but what we have removed or replaced in the input has been chosen randomly instead of our uh, method that retrieves important tokens. And then recursive ROAR has also highlighted the limitation of ROAR itself, um, where uh, they say that we should actually recompute um, highlighting every time um, we drop certain number of tokens. So if we drop 10%, uh, we should uh, recompute the attribution. Then we drop 20% and recompute the attribution and so on. Um, so yeah, one thing that's maybe clear now that I'm saying this is that for highlights, we have way more control about understanding whether the tokens we have highlighted are truly important for the model or not, or not. Unlike with explanations in plain English, where I said, this is incredibly hard problem. And I think this is a part of appeal of this method. So maybe the reason they have been so heavily and disproportionately presented in the uh, research uh, community, because we really want to get some sense of causality here, although there is no guarantee of causality whatsoever. But people here in this field really wanted to say, these are the reasons why the model had made uh, this uh, prediction. So I think this has made them uh, made way more appealing than uh, free text explanations, at least for a while. And I think everything has changed with ChatGPT and uh, these new methods for prompting that illicit reasoning. Okay, uh, we have still lots to go and I just keep talking. So. Let's maybe also take a few minutes uh, to see whether there are some questions, something you have forgotten. It's okay if you forgot, it's been a while since we talked about this, so don't be afraid to uh, ask. I'm happy to remind you. Or now that you have all the content of the course, you know, you have gone through everything and now you can revisit some of these methods with that perspective. Is there anything you would you know, like to maybe add? Yeah, please. Uh, this isn't about the content. It's maybe a dumb question. Do we have to write a uh, short sure report on a project? No, yeah, I talked about this. You don't. Okay, so... Um, Another thing I talked about through these videos uh, when uh, when we didn't meet in person is that a way to also address this uh, umbrella question is to talk about feature interactions. And uh, we know that these attention matrices have these uh, nice highlights that we can get from them where uh, for each one of the uh, words in the input, we can get the importance uh, of other words for it. Uh, this is an example where uh, we can see that the word he, which is the subject of this sentence, has very high uh, importance with words becoming and agitated. And this can suggest that this uh, maybe mechanism, attention mechanism, had captured um, subject-main-word relations. 
So this was appealing. And for a while, there was also an obsession with understanding whether these kinds of explanations are uh, faithful or not, whether they are uh, really the reason behind the uh, model's uh, prediction. So this is a this is an overview of all of the works that have followed up uh, since uh, work by uh, uh, Yain and Wallace that said attention is not explanation and then the follow-up attention is not not explanation. And in these videos, I have talked about one of the arguments that I really like for why attention is not explanation in a sense of being 100% faithful. And this is through uh, this construction of uh, matrices that um, where this new matrix you have um, constructed when multiply with the value matrix, which is the next operation in the transformer gives you the exact same output. So you know that there exists another matrix that will give you exactly the same computations, uh, raising uh, concerns of, you know, me showing you, oh, this is the reason why the model made prediction when in reality, it have used this one. So I have the possibility to show you whatever I like. And this comes from um, the fact that the value matrix, it's null space is not empty. So you can find, you can uh, take vectors from its null space, place them uh, as rows in your attention, new attention matrix, add it to your original attention matrix and you will get the exact same uh, outcome when all multiplied with the value matrix because anything that's in the null space from the matrix, value matrix multiply with the ma value matrix will give you zero by the definition of the null space. Um, so in uh, this work by Bruno Rental, they have recognized that and they said, okay, uh, let's then um, break down the our attention matrix in a component in the null space and the component orthogonal to the null space uh, orthogonal to the null space, which from linear algebra we know we can always do for any vector space. And then uh, what remains is the part that's orthogonal to the null space. So. Uh, that's the thing that survives computation with the value matrix. And let's show that rather than uh, uh, the sum in the null space and orthogonal to the null space. Um, these are just a bunch of equations, how to do that exactly. It's not really clear in the paper. Uh, they didn't really write it down. Um, so if you are interested, just check out uh, the, uh, the video. I don't want to go over all of these details. Um, but once you get the effective attention, which is again, def by definition of effective attention is the component of the original attention matrix that's orthogonal to the null space of the value matrix. Um, so here in this paper, uh, we have shown um, what changes if you plot the standard attention matrices and what happens when you use the uh, effective uh, attention matrices. So for example, here you can see that in layer seven by standard attention, the separator token has a very high importance. And here by using effective attention, we see that it's not really that important. It's actually just in this null space of value matrix of the garbage of the uh, of the value matrix. Similarly with punctuation. Um, and remember when you did your homework where you were getting these uh, lots of um, uh, importance on your punctuation with your gradient base highlight? I don't know whether anyone had investigated this, but the fact that we know that this happens with the value, with, excuse me, with the attention matrices that they seemingly pay attention to punctuation when we now have learned that it's not, it's just due to the how we visualize these things and what gets canceled out. I wonder whether there is something similar going on with the gradient-based uh, mechanisms. And I really don't know whether someone had investigated that. If not, there you go. That's a research uh, project uh, immediately. Okay, so uh, similarly to Bruna Rattal, who had proposed attractive attention at the same time, uh, this work has also recognized something similar. They have said, well, we are looking just at the numbers in value matrices, but we should also be looking at the norm of the uh, value uh, value matrices. And this really highlights this nicely. So here you have um, the 
the values that you get, just get from the attention matrices. So uh, for the separator token in layer 10 to four, it seems to be like really important. But then the uh, magnitude of the uh, value vector that we get is uh, high uh, in exactly opposite places. So it's really low where the attention scores are really high. And because what we are calculating in the end is uh, is the product of these two things, this cancels out. So similar argument, things just get canceled out. So if you were plotting this, you would say these things are very important, but they, they get to get canceled later on. So by the time they get to the loss function to the prediction, they are not relevant. So yeah, I really like both of these works. If this wasn't emphasized in the videos, uh, I think uh, these are great papers uh, to read and kind of get motivated about how just sitting down and in principle way, you can understand some of these things in a more um, reliable way and shed light on some of these um, contraintuitive insights such that punctuation is so, so, so important for the task at hand. Um, okay, any questions about that? Okay, I'm very happy I returned for my water bottle, which I forgot I would die here. All right, so then continuing with the tour of the methods we have learned, I hope you are proud of yourself, how much we actually uh, had uh, learned through these past months. We also talked about which kind of human interpretable concepts are relevant. Uh, we have um, talked about TCAP, that's a method where you have you as an expert in a domain, let's say you are now all clinicians all of a sudden, you know whether you have knowledge of saying whether certain concepts should be relevant for the certain uh, prediction of certain label. And um, you, with DCAP, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to collect the data that represents that concept. So here, a silly example, we are just predicting whether image is zebra or not. And we know that strikeness is an important concept. Therefore, we are going to collect a bunch of images with stripes, bunch of images without stripes. We are going to then um, uh, train a classifier and uh, use um, the vector orthogonal to the decision boundary as something representing that concept. And then similarly to gradient-based highlighting, we are going to check the importance of that concept by checking its uh, the model sensitivity at predicting the zebra with respect to the vector of that concept. So we know if we change that vector slightly and it was important, then the prediction of that this image shows a zebra will also be high. In that sense, this is going to be uh, measuring uh, importance. And we are going to do that. Um, we can do that only for a single image, the type of um, explainability we focused in this course, local explainability. One image, one explanation here, just a bunch of bars represent for different concepts. But we can also go a step ahead and have a more global method where we'll take all zebra images and then we're going to check whether uh, the fraction of zebra images for which the score, the, uh, the, the derivative with respect to the concept uh, vector is positive. And if the fraction is very high, if for 90% of zebra images, we get that this vector is really important for predicting zebra, then we can say, okay, um, uh, this is the TCAP score. This is the uh, importance of these concepts for predicting zebras in general. Um, there is one extra step where they kind of guard against spurious uh, CAD vectors, which are those CAD concept vectors, where you are going to compare the distribution of TCAPs uh, with the distribution of TCAPs you get when you use some random images that do not represent your uh, concept. And these need to be statistically different. If they are not, then you can't really say that this TCAP is really related to the concept. Um, and finally, one nice example of this we have seen is 
for this actual medical task of predicting whether a patient has uh, this uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is type of a diabetes related to eyes. Um, in this task, the model gets these kinds of images and needs to predict the level of uh, this uh, condition. So for example, here we have level four and uh, in green, um, you can see concepts that are truly relevant. And in, uh, in um, excuse me, red is a concept that's not relevant. And actual clinicians agree with this uh, with this picture. They say, yes, indeed, if I was to predict whether um, whether there is a level four of DR here, I would use these three first three concepts, and the last one is irrelevant. Um, in this in this example here, uh, this is this shows uh, when the TCAV is in consistence with doctor knowledge. Uh, where now here we get that this HMA concept is important for level one of DR when it's not. It's important, I think, for level two of DR. So the model is confused by these two uh, two levels. And I um, made actually wrong prediction here uh, because, uh, and, and if I made the wrong prediction, that's kind of intuitive to us. Uh, um, um, in the sense that it used the uh, wrong concept, the one uh, that's related with its uh, pre wrongly predicted class. So yeah, I think this is quite neat, uh, this kind, these kinds of analysis where uh, we can have this human interpretable concept and then measure how much these models are aligned uh, with what's known and something that becomes more and more trendy uh, these days when we talk about safety of these models. Questions? Okay, so the second to last method we talked about are data influence, where we want you to approximate the effect of removing a training example on a model's uh, prediction for a given evaluation instance. Uh, if the difference between the neural network that's trained with the full training data and the neural network trained with all except one training example is large, we can say that that training example was important for the model predicting whatever it has predicted. And the kind of the crux of how to go about this is how do we approximate this? And we talked about uh, data, influ uh, excuse me, influential functions, which is a method that's uh, been around for decades that stems from statistics and that has been uh, introduced to the machine learning community in 2017 by Koch and Liang. Uh, here, this is just a reminder that we went through these really detailed derivations of how to approximate uh, that. And after we have done a bunch of these uh, derivations, we have landed on the uh, equation that's uh, given here. We have the influence of um, of um, upweighing an example on the loss, um, excuse me, upweighing this training example on the loss of this test example uh, given uh, with this uh, equation. And upweighing is not really what we do. We want to see what would happen if there is not such examples. So we use mm, minus one over N because we have substantial number of training examples. This is going to be something small. Uh, and the minus uh, changes up weighting to down weighting. So we, we got this uh, equation from all these uh, derivations here. And the issue we then encountered is that this is, uh, this is really slow. We need to produce these Hessians that are having a terrible complexity with respect to the number of parameters and number of training uh, examples. And given that our models now range to at least 7 billion parameters, uh, then this becomes really, really uh, expensive. Already in 2017, when people had produced this, they have said, okay, we don't really need to, uh, to uh, for each test point, we can uh, pre-compute this, and then we are going to multiply it with uh, different gradients with respect to the loss of different training examples but we don't need to compute this every time for every training examples. This can be cached. Um, and um, 
we don't really want to, excuse me, uh, here, we don't really want to compute this explicitly. Uh, we want to approximate it uh, via combination of certain uh, things. So already in 2017, we have seen this, um, but it still has been slow. And I pointed you some resources in the paper you all read, you have a bunch of papers reference that try to uh, speed this up even uh, further. Um, but uh, another issue we have seen that orthogonal to the efficiency that I want to remind you of is that uh, we have seen that the these influence functions didn't approximately one out retraining well. If we are using uh, a multi linear perspectrums. So here, when we use logistic regression, we can get these nice correlations between uh, the uh, loss difference computed by influence functions and only uh, one out. So that would be like, great, we have, we did it. You know, everything is, uh, works really well. However, when we move to slightly more complicated uh, models, we get these completely different uh, correlations. And what we have learned uh, later on is that all this stems from the assumptions we, that the original work had made that actually have are not uh, fulfilled in practice. So the first problem is that we assume that we are starting from um, totally randomly initialized weights when uh, we are not, then uh, to kind of simulate uh, the convexity, people have uh, added this uh, extra term uh, and this now looks more like L2 regularization rather than the uh, original objective. And uh, we have also assumed that we are uh, training models to convergence when in, in practice, very often we do not. Uh, we don't fully get to zero when we train our models. Um, by zero, I mean our loss doesn't go to zero. So in this work by Bay et al, they have actually derived what is the actual objective that we are um, using uh, when we are deriving all this math. And their conclusion was that we the influence functions are not actually approximating leave one out, uh, loss with leave one out, but rather they are approximating the effect of removing a data point while trying to keep the predictions consistent with those of the partially trained model where partially stands for the model that's not trained to uh, full convergence. Um, and they introduced this uh, term, the uh, proximal Bregman response uh, function. So what we are actually approximating is that PBRF. And when we are doing these correlation studies, we should not be measuring the correlation with the, uh, the, uh, the test loss difference computed by leave one out, but rather the uh, the proximal Bregman response function, because that's what the uh, Tesla's difference computed by influence functions is actually approximating. So I think this is really excellent work that again shows, you know, you have this well-cited works and you just do not take them for granted. You do not assume that uh, what's there is uh, fully, paints the full picture. You take a step back and you fix the co computations and uh, get something that's more reliable when we do uh, evaluation. So uh, another another great, although dense paper to read. Okay, and our final methods was not answering the question that I have been showing you uh, along why the model had predicted uh, the class P, but rather why model predicts P instead of Q. And I've given you different examples of how you can go um, uh, addressing this uh, question, but one that we have talked about most is contrastive editing. When we check what changes to the input, change the prediction from P to Q. And quick reminder, we had this example of reading comprehension. We have this question, Anne and her children are going to Linda's home. Uh, you have been given four options by bus, car, foot, or train. And the context is, dear Anne, I hope that you and your children will be here in two weeks. My husband and I will go meet you at the train station. Our town is small, which hints that uh, the answer is by train. So uh, with contrastive editing, we check how we would need to change the uh, 
uh, how, what we would need to do to this context to change the answer form by train to on foot. And the automatically with this method, we find that uh, the context would need to say, my husband and I will go meet you uh, at your home on foot. Our house is small uh, and so uh, on. And now it kind of makes sense that the um, answer would be uh, on foot here. Uh, this method that we have used to do this um, is um, has this um, very high level idea of it that we have an editor model model that keeps masking the input text here previously context and uh, fills mask positions until an edit that changes the label is uh, found. And uh, simultaneously, we'll want to minimize the masking percentage, that is the edit size. So we are doing this multiple uh, searches or for uh, the edit that flips the size, but we are also trying to make the masking percentage uh, smaller. Uh, the metrics we use are flip rate. It has to be high. You need to flip many of the predictions. We wanted the minimality to be low. We use a uh, Levenstein distance to measure uh, the number of operations with that uh, you know, brings us from the original input to the edited input. And here there isn't a magical number. So you need to do um, some extra maybe steps if you can by comparing your minimality of your edits with minimality of human edits. And finally, we don't want the prediction to flip to another a label just because we again produce out of uh, domain examples. So we check that the uh, perplexity of the original and the edited instances is similar by uh, dividing their perplexities. So this should be close to one. And then finally, we have talked about how we can use this edits to find data shortcuts. Uh, here we have had a hypothesis that numerical ratings are leaking the um, what is the label of a sentiment review? And we have verified that, which is uh, just one example of how you can use this local explainability methods for this kind of model debugging, uh, where you can find these tokens that are disproportionately more important according to your local explainability methods relative to how many times they appear in the training data. Um, so this methodology can be used for more than just uh, mice edits. And we have seen with the, will you find this shortcuts paper that we have a pre-step to this by checking in our uh, more constrained synthetic setup, whether the, these methods would find uh, data shortcuts. If we get a positive sign, then we can go about using them for actual unknown shortcuts uh, in the data. Um, this was our final method, but something I want to emphasize is that um, there isn't like one explanation that is great for everything. And uh, sometimes the way we do, um, you know, the way we propose new methods in machine learning and NLP and the way we evaluate them is suggestive that, oh, this method is better than the other on this standard benchmark. But this is not the right way to think about it because it's not a monolithic concept. I, I didn't mention this paper before, but I really invite you to uh, check it out where the, in this paper, they outline different application scenarios and different uh, explainability usage contexts. And then for each one of them, you might have these uh, different evaluation criteria. Some of them uh, we have mentioned, such as uh, faithfulness, for example. And that also connects to the conversational model of explainability, where uh, we might have in our toolbox all these explanations. And depending on what the person actually wants, what their application context is, and what kind of thing they want to achieve, uh, through this conversation, if we can figure that out, we can provide them the best uh, explanation. So uh, this conversational way of uh, dealing with explainability are super important and way more meaningful than just uh, having these um, explanations, you know, pre us defining what should be the, the best explanation for a given context. Um, okay, so that covers all the methods. Um, when we came back from the fall break, we had then focused on the evaluation. And um, 
a lot of the evaluation we have talked about uh, through now this overview, but also in the first part of the course was this uh, functionally grounded evaluation where we don't have actual people or um, they are not doing the actual tasks they will be doing in the real world where they will get these explanations and then these explanations might benefit them. Some of them work human grounded, for example, plausibility of free text explanations when we uh, deploy uh, people like crowdsourcing platforms and ask them whether this explanation justifies the answer. This is an example where we have actual people telling us about the quality, but again, in a, a made up setup. They are not actually going to in the real world be doing this kind of evaluation of explanation. So what we need is application grounded evaluation where we have real humans, real tasks. Um, just a slight regression on before we move to application grounded stuff is that um, we one example of the human grounded evaluation that maybe wasn't super represented with our with my choices of papers we were discussing um, is uh, forward simulatability, but it is a very common choice, a uh, super often measurement you will see. So it's very important for me that you remember what it is. Uh, we have talked about it. This is not the first time we are seeing it, uh, but the idea, uh, I'm gonna go over the idea again, and that's that if your um, explanation uh, is truly related to uh, the reasoning that the model is making, then it has this power to kind of bridge the gap between what a person had known about model's behavior before uh, and uh, what it, this person will know once they have sh are shown these uh, explanations. So uh, in the setup, when we calculate simulatability, we'll have a model that gives us prediction as always this model can be uh, explained uh, using some method. And then when a person gets uh, input and explanation, they are going to make uh, their prediction of what they think models model will predict in this case. And then we check whether the actual prediction and person's guess of what the model would say is uh, more frequently the same when we provide them explanations um, relative to when they are not given explanation. So definitely remember this one. And again, it's human grounded, not application grounded. So going back to application grounded uh, evaluations, um, I, I said it before, it's kind of uh, so obvious that it makes you think like, why aren't we done this before? If we are saying explanations should help people um, increase their trust in trustworthy AI, why don't we just check whether that really happens uh, in actual applications? Uh, what prevented us to do that? And we can have a very cynical view of machine learning community, but I think there are good reasons behind what that, why that happened. Uh, and those reasons being that we had unique technical challenges, you know, features uh, in natural language processing are sequence of high dimensional vectors that are not interpretable. It's not like you have age, income, something that you understand as a feature. So when I give you importance of age was really important, you're like, yeah, I understand it. Here I'm giving you importance of some high dimensional vector. And besides the surface form of the word, you don't really get other what the other features in this vector are. We have an arbitrary number of features. So with uh, classical data mining applications, you have, let's say, 50 features, but they are fixed and they don't change from instance to instance. Since here features are token and uh, text can be, uh, you know, different of different length, now you have arbitrary number of features. Um, another issue specific to NLP, uh, let's say different than in vision, is that Actual words, actual sequence of words represent a sequence of discrete symbols. And um, when you change token representation slightly, then that, that can take you to a completely different word that entirely changes the entire meaning of the input sequence. Unlike in computer vision, where you have an image and you slightly change the pixel value, you will still get something that's similarly looking. Uh, so using continuous representations for discrete symbols is, is a challenge for sure. 
Uh, we have now models that have billions of parameters. We have seen that with the paper for data influence with using this huge, huge models, how that can be uh, problematic. We have pre-trained models. So it's not like we trained from scratch and now we have our training data. We don't even have a source of our full data and that presents many challenges with respect to you know, saying the full, given the full causal chain of where the model is making the predictions from. And then we have these inherently model, inherently interpretable models being nowhere close to our uh, LLMs. So you can't really use those and get the same uh, performance. Although there are some distillation methods between LLMs and inherently interpretable models, which I think is a good avenue to look into. So given all these challenges, the NLP explainability world has mostly focused on overcoming them and proposing these uh, methodologies for explainability where they we would show, okay, this works on these constraints uh, setups, such as reading comprehension example I showed you before. That's not a real task, right? Um, but but now, now around this year, we have a bunch of these explainability methods that have passed these proof of concept tests. So we know that in these constraint setups, uh, uh, they have uh, they are working. So given that we now know they are working, and given that with whole revolution with of large language models, we have a better sense of what are applications that people might want to, you know, have with uh, NLP and language technology. Now is the time uh, to actually do this application grounded evaluation. And there is a prevailing uh, opinion in the explainability community that we should be doing uh, that. So this is just giving you a sense from the um, inside of this research direction that this is what people want. And um, if you are producing a new method, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be rejected, but I think it has to be exceptional for people to be excited about it. So just to finish uh, with these past few minutes on types of application grounded things uh, we have talked about, this is extremely important. Um, go check it out again if you forgot what this uh, is. Uh, but everything we have talked about in terms of application grounded evaluation was in terms of human AI teams, where we said, OK, we are going to check whether explanations can help uh, for example, under reliance, we assume explanations could be helpful uh, because if the model is correct, then we assume that its reasoning is going to be plausible. And uh, we uh, deem that by people, by seeing this reasonable um, explanation, they will, and reasoning the logic behind the model, they will accept models prediction. So we check whether explanations are useful here by seeing whether by provision of explanations, the rate at which people accept correct predictions increases relative to our uh, confidence uh, baseline. Other side of the coin, over-reliance, we know that the model is imperfect and we want to guide people in rejecting incorrect predictions. And here idea is that if the model is incorrect, its reasoning will be flawed. It will have some contradictions. It's going to uh, show us information that appears illogical or contradicts what we know about the world. And here we want our explanations to um, reduce the, uh, excuse me, yeah, to reduce the number of times a person uh, accepts incorrect model uh, prediction relative to showing models confidence. And we want both of these things. We want them to accept uh, correct predictions and they reject uh, wrong ones. If we have both of these things happening, we say uh, that we have appropriate reliance and, uh, and the explanation should help us achieve appropriate reliance. To test this, we have said we are going to do a sequential approach where a person is first makes a guess on their own about what the correct label is. They're shown AI's prediction and confidence. They make another guess. They're shown explanations and they make the third guess. And then we see how the uh, guesses change um, as we in each one of these uh, stages. And the final holy grade is complementary team performance for the same reasons we think explanations can help with guiding people into appropriate alliance. We deem that they can also be helpful for uh, boosting human AI uh, team performance. Um, we have said that uh, 
Here, there are um, some these experimental setup choices we need to make in terms of choosing the data, choosing the task, uh, such that we have meaningful um, evaluations of uh, appropriate reliance and human AI theme performance. And although not necessarily, I have also urged you to use tasks that are more uh, high risk, where um, typically we say addition of explanations will be, uh, if, if use, truly useful, will be remarkable because if we can reduce overall lines in those high risk situation, that's perfect, right? That's, that's what we want to do in the, in the, in the world. Okay, and uh, finally, we have defined trust in AI. Uh, I won't go over these definitions. Uh, I think it's important that you, now taking this course, don't say things such as a key motivation of explainable AI is to increase the trust of users in AI. You know that's vague, imprecise, and you know that there are better ways to uh, express uh, this, uh, this um, uh, sentence. Um, and finally, uh, we have talked about how we can incur um, warranted trust in trustworthy model through intrinsic and extrinsic trust. And we have gone over many challenges in fostering this trust or trust uh, in AI because um, a lot of this relies on the evaluation we have. And as I have said multiple times now, the evaluation itself can be flawed. And we are continuously, because this is still active research area, we are continuously fixing these mistakes as we go. And the note I want to leave you with is that um, for the intrinsic trust, we have said this is where the explanation, local explanations can be helpful. If the user comprehends the model's reasoning and they have AI literacy, they understand what's the uh, what's behavior is trustworthy, uh, then can gain the intrinsic trust. However, through this course, uh, we have seen that the um, that this is still very active uh, area of research, and we have these methods, but we have little understanding of um, how useful they are in the actual applications. And although we have read some of the works, you have noticed that a lot of papers I have given you are from like a month or two ago. It's just a very new area uh, where people are actually evaluating all of these things in a more meaningful setups. So the message I want to leave you with is that explainable AI is ongoing research effort, not of the shell solution. So what we learn here, the, all these methods, it's not something we should be recommending everyone to use just the way it is. I hope you will all say, hey, there is this method, but you know, check it out, check this evaluation of this method and see whether it really makes sense to you because it might not be really working. There is still research going on to make it more uh, reliable. I'm also not saying that we should give it up from it, but it's something you should ask me about in like three to five uh, years because that, that might change. Okay, so we are out of time. Uh, reminder that there are office hours on Wednesdays if you wanna chat about the content of the course uh, or maybe get a quick feedback on your uh, posters. Yeah, please. Um, real quick, group 12 finally figured out our, our survey okay. thing. The hits are incredibly quick, like 30 seconds. There's a thing on um, Piazza, so okay. if you do that, be like, if you see the same one. All right, yeah, let's do that for Jacob. Okay, see you.